Hi, this is Leo Lyons from 170 Split, and you're listening to Backbeat with Andre Graziade. All music is the same. It's just a new set of lyrics and a new backbeat. All right, Andre Graziade here today for the Backbeat Experience in a chat with Leo Lyons, a legendary bass player for 10 years after. Um, how was it uh, growing up? To, uh, what kind of did you grow up with music in the family, or um, well, to, to a certain extent? I mean, there was no uh, rock music on radio when I was growing up until I was maybe ten or eleven. Yeah, my grandfather played in the brass band, but uh, he was dead long before I came along. So, oh, too bad. There was a little bit of uh, a void. Um, I first started listening to music on the radio. You know, we had uh, Radio Luxembourg, a very faint signal for an hour or two most yeah. evenings and, and then the skiffle thing happened in the UK which was like um, bluegrass music without uh, the expertise you know, with Lonnie Donegan and people like that and then I first heard the electric guitar which would probably have been Bill Haley or something like that and Chuck Perry, Little Richard, Elvis. So that All turned you on to rock and roll? That kind of did it, yes. So what made you decide to actually take up the bass? Um, well, I, I first started playing the guitar, I went for guitar lessons, but I, I wasn't in the band, and my guitar teacher introduced me to some other guys, some other pupils, and I started playing with them, you know, rehearsals and the wedding, that kind of thing, and uh, they had no bass player, I had no amp, didn't even have an electric guitar, but, so I borrowed an electric guitar and played the bass notes on the electric guitar, and um, I took to it, I loved it. So I, was that sort of a challenge, playing bass on an electric guitar? Um, well, because it, you, you're an octave up on the thing. In fact, when I first got a bass guitar, I, I couldn't get my head around playing an <laughs> octave down. And the amplifiers at the time were, didn't really handle the bottom end that well. Right. I think it kind of shaped my style, because a lot of the stuff I do an octave up from, from normal. So in, in some ways, it was an advantage. It was an advantage, yeah, it, it formed my style. I, I play um, contrabass, upright bass too, and, and I can go down the low end, but, uh, yeah. So you've, paid, you've played countless uh, uh, concerts over the last 50 years now. Well, actually, for, yeah. thousands, I guess. Thousands, yeah. yeah. So, of course, Legendary was the stepping stone, I would yes. think. Yes, yes, the Woodstock. The Woodstock, I think the, the, that whole era, uh, yeah. and, and I know you, you're from America, um, w was absolutely fantastic for music and there were lots and lots of festivals. The thing with Woodstock was it was filmed and in many ways it was a, a disaster from a... From, a, um, from an organizational yeah, standpoint, yes, yeah. that, certainly. And, and it became a movie and that was, that was what sparked it. And it was a, the movie, I think, was a, a, a light of hope for people in, in the Eastern Bloc countries that couldn't really listen to the music they wanted to listen to. Mm -hmm. you know, and, the last 10, 15, 20 years working in Eastern Europe, people say, wow, you know, we used to listen to that and people would get arrested for having rock records. Really? Yeah, I've met quite a few people. Where, in Europe? In Europe, spend a night in jail because they had a record. I wow. met a lady last year from, I think she was from Poland and she said she was arrested for... That's something I've never heard of. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's illegal. It's propaganda, I guess. That's the way it was looked at. So, okay. So that movie was quite important to a lot of people. Right. The, well, you know, yeah, that was the, the, how do you say, that was the... the, the, it, was the light, it was a light of hope, I think. The cornerstone of the hippie age. Yeah, it was, yes. And it's pretty much the end of it, too. It was, well. I mean, then it's not all the love and flower power because, I mean, there was a war going on, wasn't there? Vietnam. There, there was the Vietnam War. There was the... the, the, the the um, freedom marches, or, you know, racism going on. It was pretty hairy, hairy times. And it polarized America, I think. Well, you know, the young people, if you had long hair, you were for this, against that, and so on and so forth. So, hmm. Interesting times. So you've not only been a musician, you've done some work on musicals, which then have involved Yeah, yeah, yeah I've, done, I've done a few things. I, I, um, I worked as a uh, uh, I run a recording studio, actually. I, I had two or three of my own and worked as a recording engineer mm. and a writer, too, a songwriter. It pays to have several strings to your bow, I think. It's nice to have a back door. Yeah, it is. I, and I enjoyed all. I mean, when I reached the age, stupidly, now looking back, 27 and, and 10 years after the band I was with, took a hiatus, I guess. We, I thought we'd broken up. And I, I, I thought I was too old to go on the road. I was 
So I, I, I worked in production, you know, producing bands and that kind of thing. So what is the difference, the notable difference for you between producing and playing in a band? Um, I think playing, playing live is my first love. I right. enjoy that. I, the energy, I like the interaction with, with the people. Um, it's a question of, um, you know, what they say kind of an, an athlete gets into the zone and you draw on, on the higher inspiration. Right. It doesn't sound too. And uh, that's what I like about playing. When you're almost a, a vehicle for some creative energy that comes from out of nowhere. And that's the buzz uh, with playing. Production, I like that too. When everything's going well, it's a wonderful place to be. But sometimes it's, it doesn't always go well. And, 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 and it's a job. It's, um, it's a job that I enjoy. But my job is to get the best out of the musician. Or, or, or the musicians in, in the studio, and that involves lots and lots of different ways of doing it. Uh, so what would be the biggest challenge as a producer? Um, I t to be taken out of my depth, I guess. And I, I, During the punk era, for example, I, I, I tried to work with punk acts, but I couldn't get my head around the fact that some of them couldn't play. Uh -huh. and, and I missed the point, because that was really what it was all about. That was the whole point. The whole point. And someone said to me, if you can't make it good, make it as bad as you possibly can. <laughs> but I have to feel something for the music, really. Right. I, I turned down a lot of work because I didn't want to work with certain people and without mentioning any names. It uh, would have been a financially stupid thing for me to do, turning it down. But well, there wouldn't be any heart in it if, if there's... No, you know, and that's the important There's no thing. point. That really is the important thing for me about life. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, still doing what I'm doing. Um, I enjoy it and I've got a goal, a personal goal, I guess. And uh, it's just to get better at what I do and to, and to enjoy it. And I, I don't know what else I'd do. I mean, if I retired, I'd be just another miserable old man complaining about the price of food at the, at the supermarket checkout, I guess, mm -hmm. or asleep in front of the television. That's like, uh, was it Roger Daltrey and who? And, 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 and was it musicians don't die, they just fade away? Yes, that's possibly so, yeah. yeah. So as far as producing is concerned, well, you grew up in the age of analog, and now everything is digitalized. It is, yes. So which do you prefer? I prefer analog. Um, I like the warmth of it. I like the spontaneity of it. I don't like the idea of... Of, I mean, we record digital now, we have to in, in lots of cases. I don't like the idea of I'll do the guide bass to the guide drum to the guide guitar and then I'll pick it up later. And then we'll change, we'll put samples with the drum kit, we'll change the snare drum 14 times and change the, then the bass doesn't fit, change the sound of the bass and the guitar doesn't fit. It's, it's an endless thing. And I think it loses the heart sometimes if mm -hmm. it goes on too long. And with 170 split, um, we try to do, even if we're not recording analog, we try to do it in the old way, in the studio, get it down. If there's a mistake, we can patch it up, but generally, just make it happen. And this latest record, The Road, we, um, was done intentionally on the road because I wanted the spontaneity of playing live. Uh -huh. So we recorded maybe half a dozen shows, I guess. Uh -huh. Kind of like uh, Jackson Brown uh, running on empty. Yes, and... Um, you know, no overdubs. So, so as far as, as recording in the studio, do you guys go live to tape, or is it every do, everyone does their parts? No, no. What we what we're trying to do is to go live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we with, may have we may have to pick up a vocal because of spill, yeah. or there may be an odd mistake. But I think if you rehearse, you've got the energy, you you get the environment right too. I mean, there's something to be said from going to a different location and recording. Um, I don't mean the Seychelles or something like that, but if you're recording in Arizona or if you're recording in, in New York or, or the country or, or the city, it's a different vibe. And, and, and sometimes that, that defines the record. So um, when you say different vibe, what is it that defines, then, would that then define the sound of, of, of I think the album? The, I think it defines the way the musician feels about playing, right. either optimistically or, or, or not so. I mean, if you go back to, um, the ten years after Record of Space in Time, which I, I don't know whether you remember, very it was the one with um, I'd Love to Change the World. Right? Okay. That was the record that came out after the band had had a certain amount of success, everybody was living in the country, in their country houses, you know, the, the old rock star thing, and it was mellow and it had some melody to okay. it. And I think that's what defined that record. I'm not saying that 170 Spivigan are going to go mellow, but yeah. 
but I think there's, there's an energy you pick up on, an enthusiasm, you get some ideas. Um, if you're recording in Arizona, you might write God knows how many songs about mountains and straight roads. I, I don't know <laughs> that. Uh, or the plight of the American, the Native American. But, uh, so as a songwriter, you then moved to Nashville? Yes. Um, what was that for a culture? Was there some kind of culture shock? Or you had been to the States before, but... Oh, many, many times. No, I, I've always liked country music. And um, when the 80s pop thing was happening in, um, in the UK, I, I was writing country music. And um, there didn't seem to be a place for me. So I, I started to send uh, songs to Nashville, and that was uh, hopeless. I may as well swim across there with one arm tied behind my back. <laughs> so I, I went there, and I hauled up and down Music Row with, with my cassettes at the time, and um, got a publishing deal with, with a Nashville, as, as a staff writer. And um, one of the deals, part of my deal was I had to move there. So, and I thought, well, it's going to take quite a while to get the green card and all that, but it happened so quickly. Mm-hmm. I had to move before I was really ready. I got a couple of young sons at the time. And over I went, which was 17 years ago now. So now you're back in the UK? I know I'm back. Well, I, I reached a point in my life where I couldn't see myself, not that I intend to retire right now, I couldn't see myself retiring in America. And I think like plants, you know, sometimes you thrive better in the soil, you keep <laughs> in your home soil. So I thought if I'm going to have to move, Maybe I'll move, which was two years ago. Maybe I'll move now, whilst I can still understand the 57 forms you have to fill in to right. ex, ex, what do you call it? expatriate yourself from the United States. <laughs> <laughs> it is quite a complicated affair, so I did that. But I still have a home in Nashville. Okay. So, 10 years after, and then came along 170 split, uh, you were kind of like juggling two bands at that point. So We what were at the time. I mean, the problem was, I. It, it kind of started out, an, an American record company asked me to do a solo record. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not really a solo record person, but I thought I'll do a record and get a few people, a few guests and things like that. And I asked Joe, who was a guitar player with 10 years after, if he'd like to come along and write a few songs with me and play on the record. And I thought it'd be really good for him to get out, get out of the umbrella of, is he as good as Alvin, is he better than Alvin? You know, and all those things, Alvin Lee, that is, um, within the 10 years after thing. So we, we got together and we wrote some songs, and I'm waiting for the record company, I'm suggesting guests, and they're suggesting guests, and then they're suggesting distributors, and then sponsorships, and, and the whole thing. I got fed up with it, so I booked some time, went in the studio in Nashville with Joe and a drummer that I knew, and we recorded four tracks, and that turned into a record, and all of a sudden we, we were a band and we needed a name. Uh-huh. And this was going to be a, a side project um, that we, we did it outside of 10 years after because working within 10 years after for me had become a little bit frustrating. I liked playing the 10 years after songs but it meant that I had to do that and nothing else. That's, that was what the other guys in the band expected me to do, nothing else. Right. So it didn't go down too well really to, trying to do this side project. And cross marketing in the business, talking in the business happens all the time now, you know, with Government Mule and Derek Trucks and mm-hmm. all those people. So I thought it would be good for the band, but they disagreed. So to cut a long story short, we had to <laughs> split, as you said. Earlier. Right. <laughs> yeah. So now uh, you've had some, I, I don't know, how, how successful has it been 170 split? Well, it's, um, we finished with 10 years after 2013. So two, so we, this will be our, not even a year and a half now. Right. It's, it's building, it's building quite quickly. The first 12 months it took a while. Well, since 2012 when we were doing the two, it was very difficult, it was confusing everybody. Right. Um, and I think it's a great thing that we have split, um, left the band, I should say, split. And um, this latest record, it, it's hovering between one and three in the Amazon Blues rock charts, so that shows that there's interest. The venues are getting larger. Cool. As they say, so what's in the, the hotel is the best in town. Yeah, <laughs> that kind of thing, all that the stuff. hotels get better. Yeah, the hotels. Um, what's the notable difference between the music of the two bands? Um, more enthusiasm. We, we have more enthusiasm. Um, I'm working with two two younger guys. I think sometimes, not all musicians. I mean, some mu- some musicians go to their death. 
playing just as well as they did when they were in the 20s. And some just get fed up with it and just go through the motions. And I think there's more energy. Um, it's in, another, it's in another challenge. Energy. Yeah, it's another challenge. And I think the challenge is the thing, you know, I said earlier, you know, you want to play them, um, you know, somewhere like the Marquee or the Reading Festival and then, uh, you know, Madison Square Garden and the Forum, you know, they're all kind of... For no, no, no financial reasons, it's just a little target you set, set for yourself. And, um, kind of like the notches on your belt, just... Yeah, it's silly really, but uh, I kind of enjoy that. I enjoy the striving I mean, who wouldn't? For it. Yeah, I enjoy the striving for it, you know. So and to start from scratch is great, it just puts the, it puts the edge on it. You know, yeah. hungry fighters make champions, they say. And you can become very blasé when you, you know, you're in a band, you've got a name, people will come and see you, you do the show. And you see so many of these musicians, they lose the point, don't they? Complain about the food. We've all seen Spinal Tap. I mean, oh, yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's very true. That's what it's like. That's closer yeah. to truth than truth Abs is. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And it gets like that. Whereas, you know, all, all the guys today, um, we had a late night. We had to get up early. Nobody complained. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody was here. So I was looking at your website, which uh, happens to be uh, very interesting. Yeah, I, I liked it. Um, I read that you're into uh, the paranormal. What fascinates, yes, yes, what right. fascinates you about that? Um, well, I, I grew up in a haunted house. Oh, really? A, a, a disturbingly haunted house. Okay. Um, so you've experienced this firsthand? Oh, God, yes. Well, I, I, I think my first experience is probably, I can recall, from less than a year on, it happened to me. And um, when I was, I think, five years old, I, I had polio and I was confined in hospital in an isolation ward for months and months. And I don't think my, uh, getting too technical, my psychic sense is closed down. Right. So as a child, I, I was seeing all sorts of things. I should have written a damn movie, but I didn't. My <laughs> wife said that. Um, but uh, so I, I grew up with the paranormal and, and I was afraid of it, absolutely terrified so um, well who wouldn't it's not normal yeah, it's not normal and people said it wasn't normal and you know up until the age of possibly 16 I thought oh, maybe I was going a little mad right and uh, when I was about 20 27 30 I decided I had to sort it out I was afraid of the dark basically mm. any house that was a bit weird I'd, I'd pick up on all sorts of atmosphere vibes, vibes. yeah not quite like some of these horror movies, but no, yeah. pretty disturbing. And so I, I decided to confront my fears and I enlisted in the College of Psychic Studies. So I, um, I learned to turn off the tap. Oh, okay. So now I can turn it on or off. And oh, cool. So at the, at the age of 71, I'm not afraid of the dark anymore. That's, that's yeah. nice to hear. <laughs> yeah. But, okay. Uh, well, interesting story. Yeah. Well, I, I did. I've, I do have a book, but I've, I, whether I'll ever finish it, I don't know. Uh, uh, was this, would this be an autobiography? Yes. Oh. I, well, I, I started one with the band, and I started one about the the other side of my life, right? Which is called the reluctant psychic. And um, but I, I haven't finished either. I enlisted a, a songwriting friend of mine in Nashville that when I was back there in January. I said, let's finish the book, but we haven't. To, we haven't done anything with it yet. I thought his enthusiasm would, for me to finish it would drive us on. But of course we're on the road. We're uh, on okay. the musical journey at the moment. Exactly. Yeah. So let's see now, a word association, what would you associate with, uh, say, summer? Summer? Right. Well, it, I guess it would be that all those festivals we played in the summer. We always think of that, you know, the Summer of Love. Okay. Woodstock, of course, the Isle of Wight Festival. Uh -huh. And the Reading Festivals. Uh, what about winter? Winter, winter for me is always tours, 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 tours. In winter, really? Yeah, Dece through November to December. Okay. And then mid-December, then there's a little break, and then sometimes there's January. January historically for ten years after was the month the band broke up. It always broke up every January, but it always went back. On okay. Tour again. It wasn't a break. It was a break up. It was a break up. Yes, it always <laughs> seemed to come around January. Okay. Yeah. Um, sunrise? Sunrise, I've seen many. 
Um, not so many now. I do. I am. I'm an early person now. Really? I, I like to get up early. Yeah. Most musicians aren't. I know. I know. It's a little bit weird. I mean, my wife likes to stay up fairly. She's not a musician, but she likes to stay up fairly late. I like to get up early. Okay. Unusual. I do. Um, I I'm feel more in control of my thinking early in the morning. Okay. I and in the in the evening, I just want to relax. And what about sunset? Sunset, Arizona, I would think, one of the most wonderful sunsets. Oh, I would imagine that. I enjoy it. Have you played Red Rocks? Yes. Oh, fantastic yeah. place, isn't it? It is fantastic, yeah. Um, those are the sunsets I enjoy. I, I had a fascination as a kid with the American West. Uh-huh. Um, and I've, I've done a lot. I had horses. I've done lots of riding in America and in California and places like that. And in the desert and things. So I, 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 whenever I think of it, a sunset, I think of a, a, a desert sunset with all that incredible red. Great place. Mm-hmm. Well, Leo, thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah. Uh-